This is uh, series is called Say What. It's the last uh, last uh, message in the series. If you missed it, it's on our YouTube, iTunes, Facebook page, our podcast. The Bible says a lot about our words, speech, heart, and walk with God in relation to our witness, lifestyle, and testimony. All through the Bible, it warns us about our speech. And it encourages us to, for, to have certain speech as well. Jesus gave the main teaching on this in Matthew 12. He said, you brood of vipers, how can you who are evil say anything good? For the mouth speaks what the heart is full of. So sometimes we go, man, I need to, you know, uh, learn to control my mouth. Really, what we need to do is learn to purify our hearts. For the mouth speaks what the heart is full of. And then Jesus explains it in verse 35. A good man brings good things out of the good that's stored up in him. An evil man brings evil things out of the evil stored up in him. Explains it. But then he reminds us. But I tell you, that everyone will have to give an account on the day of judgment for every empty word they have spoken. So the video is running. You're going to see this, what you're doing, what you're saying. You're going to see it soon. Again, when we stand, uh, when we stand before the Lord. Psalms 143 says, Set a guard over my mouth, Lord. Keep a watch over the door of my lips. If you're married... He's already provided that guard for you, okay? If you've ever felt a nudge, a kick under the table, shh, or the look. Anyone ever got the look? I don't know what that means. I've never gotten that, just hypothetically, you know, so. So some people don't have any discretion. They have no capacity to to stop when they're upset. There's no filter. There's, you know, no red light uh, in their heart, but... Learning to control our speech and purify our heart is foundational. It's part of our growth in God. It's part of our our maturing in the Lord. Uh, uh, we need to grow in this area. If you through this series, if you maybe God has spoken to you, this is a growth area for you, growing in our faith. Also, it says we are transformed by the renewing of our mind. Okay, so it's not just putting my hand over my mouth, but it's, it's the purification of my mind and our heart. Many people want to be used by God. They want God to do something amazing in their life, and God can't open the doors for you because you can't keep your mouth shut. All right? So, you know, like, like there's just too much conflict. There's too much collateral damage that comes with your speech. There's too much fighting in our homes. There's too much arguing with our, in our marriages. There's too much fighting with our kids and our, in our life. And, and we've got to get this as believers. We've got to get this area under control. All right. So previous weeks, we've looked at the impact of negative words, angry, harsh words, reckless words. We've looked at obscenity, profanity, blasphemy, sexually oriented conversation and jokes. We looked at gossip and slander. Last week, we talked about fighting and arguing lies and half-truths. There are some people that just have a contentious spirit, okay? They just want to fight and argue all the time. We looked at the impact of positive words, encouragement and affirmation, the importance of worship, declarations of faith and prophetic prayers. And last week, we talked about in the midst of fighting and arguing, how to handle that by speaking the truth in love, having godly conversations. I was very practical on that. If you missed that last week, you need to go back and hear it. And also saying, saying I'm sorry. Okay, so today we're going to, the impact of our negative words, we're going to look at whining and complaining. We're going to have revival at the end. In worship, the Lord was just paving the way. Whining and complaining. And just for fullness, grumbling and murmuring too. So I don't want you to go, I only murmur, but I don't whine. So we're getting it all. All right. So that is the constant dissatisfaction or annoyance about something. Subversive complaining and verbal discontent with the purpose of planting seeds of negativity uh, and doubt in a muted kind of way. Now there is no greater example than, than whining and complaining <clears throat> than the Hebrews 
when they were in the wilderness, okay? Now, if you remember this story, God, while they were in Egypt, God heard their groans. He heard their crying. He heard their prayers because they were suffering. They were beat down, and God, God heard that. And then God, through Moses, he sent a deliverer to get them out of their misery. And you remember the story of the plagues? That came and as, as the Lord was opening the hand of Pharaoh and then, man, there was the Passover. Remember that at the, the night when the, the angel came over and they had the, the blood on the door frames and there was this miraculous deliverance. And if you remember also that the Egyptians gave gold and silver and food to the fleeing Hebrews, they saw that miracle right before their eyes. They went just a few days later And they found themselves in a difficult situation. They had the Red Sea on one side and the approaching troops of of Pharaoh's army coming to them. If you remember the story, Moses raised his hand. Uh, Over the next uh, eight hours or so, a wind blew, divided the Red Sea. The Hebrews walked over. The waters collapsed on the Egyptians. What a wonderful miracle. And it was such a huge, impactful miracle that Moses' sister Miriam pulled out her tambourine and they had a worship service. Do you remember when we used to bring tambourines to the church? I am glad those days are over. People that could not qualify for the worship team always brought a brand new tambourine. And I want to tell you, when I was a youth pastor, I'm not proud of this, but if you left it on Sunday, it just mysteriously disappeared. They just begin to worship. This Hundreds of thousands of people begin to magnify God because of this miracle that they had just seen right before their eyes. They saw the plagues. They saw the Passover. They saw the Red Sea. What a miracle. And then if you go along in the reading, three days later, Exodus 15, some people grumbled against Moses saying, where are we going to get water? What are we going to drink? Got it. Three days later, 72 hours after the Red Sea, they're already complaining. And I just want to say as a pastor, that's just about right. Some things have never, some things have never changed. They grumbled against Moses. They grumbled and complained because they had no water. They weren't sure where their food was coming from. Exodus 6, it says, I've heard the grumbling of the Israelites. The Lord said, he said, it wasn't prayers. Lord, we're hungry. Lord, we're we're trusting in your provision. It was whining and complaining. He's, he, do you know he can tell the difference in your tone? You know, your words may be the same, but he gets the tone of that. I've heard the grumbling of the Israelites. Tell them at twilight you will eat meat. You're going to drop quail in the evening, and in the morning you'll be filled with bread, manna, and then you will know that I'm God. Manna, manna, like a a little wafer, honey-flavored wafer. It'd just be like God dropping fresh-baked Krispy Kreme in your lap every morning, and the red light is already on. That's what they, that's what they got. But it goes on, Numbers 11, and the people complained, <clears throat> about their hardships in hearing of the Lord. And when he heard them, his anger was aroused. Then fire from the Lord burned among them and consumed some on the outskirts of the camp. Numbers 11.4. The rabble, the troublemakers with them began to crave other food. And again, the Israelites started wailing and said, if we only had meat to eat, we remember the fish we ate in Egypt at no cost. Also the cucumbers and the melons and the leeks and the onions and the garlics. But now, we, garlic, but now we've lost our appetite. We never see anything but this manna. Numbers eleven eighteen. Tell the people, consecrate yourselves in preparation for tomorrow when you will eat meat. The Lord heard you when you wailed. If we only had meat to eat, we were better off in Egypt. Now the Lord will give you meat and you will eat it. You will not just eat it for one day or two days or five or ten or twenty, but a whole month until it comes out of your nostrils and you loathe it. 
because you have rejected the Lord. I think someone is irritated. I just feel it. All right. Who is among you? And wailed before them that said, why did we ever leave Egypt? So, you may be going whining and complaining. You know, that's kind of minor. It's not that big of a deal in our relationship with God. And I would go, you are wrong. You are wrong. It was not godlessness or the practice of other religions that got the Hebrews in trouble with God. It was whining and complaining. All right? It's not that big a deal. It is a huge deal. It wasn't sexual sins. It wasn't Baal worship. It was whining and complaining in the midst of living in God's provision. Okay, so some things to remember about this. A chronic complainer will never recognize or see God's blessing. A chronic complainer will never recognize or see God's blessing. So it's like <clears throat> when we fly somewhere. Let's just say like we're going from Tallahassee to California. And we get on the plane <clears throat> and we don't have the full selection of movies that we would like. The sandwich is a little stale. The person sitting next to me is a little heavy. That wouldn't be us. That would be them. And when we get off the plane in a couple of hours in California, we go, that was a terrible flight. But you've missed the miracle of what just happened. You were strapped on a rocket, okay? And you were flown. You violated all the rules of, you know, gravity, and you followed some rules of aerodynamics, and you went in an aluminum tube at 600 miles an hour. You landed safely across the continent. A few hours later, you're not driving. By the time you landed in California, you would have only been in Mobile if you're headed west, probably already changing a flat tire, all right? But you've missed the miracle. But you walk off the flight and go, man, that was a terrible flight terrible flight. So complaining kind of frames our minds in a negative way. Now, I am sure they were tired of manna. I'm sure quail every afternoon. I mean, I understand that, the heat of the desert, but they had forgotten about stomping around in the mud in Egypt. They had forgotten about the generational slavery. They had forgotten about the senseless murders, the beatings, the hopelessness that they had of, of living generationally for 400 years. They had forgotten about that, and they complained. They did not realize that in the midst of their complaining, that God had blessed them. They had meat in the evening, manna at morning. They were safe. They did not have to worry about, you know, being pulled out of their house, being beaten, abused, murdered. They were following God's plan. A cloud by day, a fire by night. A little later, he introduced the tabernacle to them where they could worship and see and sense God's presence. They'd forgotten all that. Because once you kind of come to the default, of emo default emotion of whining and complaining, that's all you see. Now, some of you, you've got a few things in your life that aren't perfect that you, that you would like to change, okay? But when we whine and complain, we lose perspective of where God has brought us from. They're in the midst of the desert. It is imperfect. I get that. But they had forgotten where they had come from. So I want to ask you this morning, where did God bring you from today? Look back in your life. Where would you be this morning if it was not for the cross of Jesus? Where would you be today? giving thanks for what God has done and what he is doing in our lives. It's kind of like this. If you've got kids, all right, do you ever hear, <clears throat> we have nothing to eat around here. 
There is nothing to do around this house. I don't have anything to wear. We ne I never get to go anywhere. We never get to do anything. You ever hear anything like that? Now, if you've got younger kids, you wait. Your fun's coming in a few years. But I want to say, how do you feel? How do you feel when you hear that? When you hear your kids, okay? You just want to go off. If it was biblically correct, you would do it. Because you're working hard, trying to provide the best. Don't complain over it. It's the same, it's the same way. Be careful when you complain about your life. You may feel terrible when you see the fullness of God's plan work out. All right? Be careful. You don't know what God's doing, okay? They were not at the final destination. They were not at the end of what God had for them. God had some other, some other plans. The season that you are in now, the things that you are walking through, this is not the final destination that God has for you. Some of them had no idea in the midst of their whining and complaining that they were on course of a destiny to a land that flowed with milk and honey. They did, some didn't know. They're just like, look, what's going on right now? They didn't know that spies had gone into the land and they brought fruit back so big that it, that it took, you know, it took multiple people to carry. They had no idea what God was doing. So I want to say, in the midst of you kind of whining, complaining, murmuring, and, you know, uh, uh, being upset, you don't know what the next, you know, the, the next step that God has for you and your life and we know at the end, many, many missed it. They didn't get to go in. There was a lot of reasons, but murmuring and complaining were right there with it. So I want to ask you this morning, what are you going to miss out on that God had originally planned for you because you're murmuring, you're complaining, and you're in faithfulness? They started out well, but many did not get to cross over. They never saw the fulfillment of, of God's plan for their life because they had, this, they had this attitude. Complaining affects how I view things in the future. It frames my mind. A whiner and complainer we, we, it will always be a whiner and complainer. They see the world that way. The Hebrews, when they complain, they just didn't have a bad week or a bad month. This went on for years. They had developed the habit and the pattern of whining and complaining. They never grew beyond going, man, I hate where I'm at right now. I can't stand it. I want to, I want to, you know, uh, I'm believing God for a new season. They never grew beyond that. They never grew in their understanding of God's character, that he is for me, but not against me, that he is my heavenly father and he would do nothing, you know, kind of nothing just irresponsible toward me. They never grew in their understanding of God's character. They never grew in their understanding of how God's plans work out for our life. They thought that everything that has to do with God, man, you leave Egypt and you go straight to the promised land. They never knew that there were wilderness experience and ups and downs in their life. You know, so this wasn't just a bad week or a month. They were framed by this negativity and this, this whining and complaining. Harvard Mental Health Letter, they sent, they did a, did a study, and it was called In Praise of Gratitude. So they asked people in this study to keep an irritation journal, all right? They wanted you to write down everything that irritated you over the course of a day, okay? Now, some of you already do that. You know, you just, that's your prayer list, okay? So here's what they found in this study, that those that listed their discontents became more discontent and found more things that irritated them. So let's just say like the first day, there were four things, 
And then the next week, there were seven things, and this thing kind of grew. It became the lens that they began to look at their life through, okay? When whining and complaining and murmuring and being upset, when that, when that is the lens that you view everything with, man, there, it's just going to be a lot of negativity that goes on in your life because whining is the opposite of worship. Whining is the opposite of worship. Lord, I thank you. Lord, I'm standing here, and Lord, I don't know every answer that you have. I don't know what's going on theologically, but I want you to know I stand with my hands lifted to you with worship and praise on my lips. I know that you are faithful, and there's going to be a day that I'm going to see the salvation and the deliverance of the Lord. But whining's the opposite of that. God, what are you doing? Do you know the misery that I'm in? Do you know what's going on in my life? Whining is the opposite of worship. And I want to tell you, it can cancel them out, cancel each other out as well. What you do here on Sunday morning for a few minutes can be canceled out by the hours of whining throughout the day, throughout your week, all right? So I, I talked a few weeks ago to men that, you know, the, about angry and harsh words. I talked last week to ladies about uh, uh, being quarrelsome and, you know, uh, fighting. Now I have a word from the Lord for our teenagers and our young adults living at home, okay? All right? Philippians 2, 4 is for you. Do everything without complaining. Do everything without complaining, okay? So is that you? There's nothing to eat. There's nothing to do. I don't have anything to wear. I never get to go anywhere. We never have any. We never do anything. I want to say, if you're living at home with your parents, in the midst of being blessed by the Lord, do you do you whine and complain about the few things you know, kind of unresolved in your life? Maybe you don't show appreciation to your parents. You complain, but you don't realize how good that you have it, you know. You ought to hear some of the calls we get at the church. People homeless, don't know where their next meal's coming from, you know, just have their life turned up, upside, upside down, okay. So, I just want to go, I mean, you're blessed. So, when your parents say, take out the trash, don't complain. Don't complain. You don't know. I'm gifted. I'm gifted. I'm in the, I, you know, I'm, I'm, I've got a scholarship coming. No, no. I will take out the trash. I, just take out the trash. Just hush. Don't say anything negative. That's your thing. Take it out. Listen, I may take out the trash alumni, okay? I just want you to know that was my responsibility at home. Take out the trash. If they tell you to make up your bed in the morning, before you leave, don't, don't whine and complain. Just do it. Do everything without complaining. Just, just do it. Help out in the yard. Help out around the house. Whatever it is, just do it. Don't complain. That's God's word to you. Don't whine. If your parents ask you to do something, do it. You're living in the midst of a miracle. There are a lot of teenagers that would love to trade places with you in that miserable place that you call home. They would love to pull up at your dinner table. They would love to get in your bed under your covers. They would love to have, they would love to have your life. So don't complain. Don't complain. Don't complain. Do what your parents ask you to do and do it with joy. When Kendra was small, I, Kendra was doing her fingernails in the room, other room, and I said, Kendra, get your fingernail polish up and take it to your room. This is what she did. Hello. Got it in me. There we go. That's what she did. She did exactly what I told her to do. When I saw that, do you think that brought joy to my life and worship to my lips? Nope. Nope. 
So if you don't like where you live, if you don't like the meals, if you don't like the rules, then you have another option. Move out. Move out. Just go. You can't stay and whine and complain. You need to move out. But I'm just going to you, if this is an area of growth, then, then you let God touch your heart. And when you're asked to do something, don't whine and complain. Just do it. Just, all right. The impact of positive words, thanksgiving. The opposite of whining and complaining, thanksgiving. 1 Thessalonians 5.18, in everything give thanks in all circumstances. I love that. Not when the answer comes, when life's going well and the bank accounts are full. and everything, give thanks in all circumstances. Ephesians 5, 4. Nor should there be obscenity, foolish talk, coarse joking, which are out of place, but rather thanksgiving. Thanksgiving. Okay, so uh, just a couple of things. We're gonna, thankful to God and saying thanks to others, showing appreciation to others okay that we 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 can do this we can compliment others we're going to talk about being thankful to God in just a moment we can talk about having a thankful heart to others right now proverbs 10 says the lips of the righteous nourish many saying thanks showing appreciation you know expressing thanks for for someone that's done something for you so i'll say to the men show appreciation to your wife even if it scares her at first she may follow up with, are you feeling okay? Are you, are you good? But I want to say to the men, especially if our wife works full time or they homeschool, you know, then we got to give some latitude and some appreciation around the house, okay? And be, be thankful, be thankful. Probably 95% of the time after dinner, I say, thank you. I appreciate that, all right? And I want to tell you why. Because before I got married, and I got married later in life, I didn't have dinner served for me. I lived by myself in an apartment. I was a youth pastor, and I was broke. Do you know times when you're broke, but you don't know you're broke, so you're happy? Then the light bulb goes on, and you go, man, I'm broke. What is going on in my life? You know, so my dinner, my dinner was, I had a convenience store across the street, and at 9 o'clock, they would cut the food in half, the prices in half of the leftover convenience store items, okay? Deep fried burritos, corn dogs, hamburgers, potato wedges, all the full healthy, you know, kind of options. And that's what I would buy. That's what I would eat, okay? And I did that for years. So now when I sit down and there is a meal that has been cooked, or maybe it's a sandwich, or maybe we have picked up something on the way home, I say thank you because there was a long period of time that there was nothing like that for me. So I just, and I, look, I know it's part of the marriage contract. You know, I do certain things, she does certain things, but it never hurts to say thank you and show appreciation. It never hurts. And my wife's She's a great cook. You give her a can of cream of mushroom soup, and there's going to be a miracle that's coming out of the kitchen. <laughs> All right? When I see that can open, I don't know what it is, but it's going to be amazing. Last night, she cooked something, and I said, what is this? She said, I have no idea. I just threw some things in the, in the, in the dish. And it was amazing. And if you want the recipe for the dish, I don't know what I did, but I just threw it in the dish. Just ask her after church. All right? So, and, and the same thing with men who do yards and cars. We can, we can always say thanks and we can be appreciative. We can be appreciative to colleagues and people that we work with. I pay people around here to do things, but I always try to go, hey, thank you. I appreciate that. I don't have to say that because I pay them. But I, I do appreciate what they do. You can be kind on the job site, even if people are... You know, they're, they're your employees. You can still show gratitude and appreciation. When we go do business, when we're out in the world, listen, if there's ever anyone that we need to be kind to, it's waiters and waitresses, okay? Sometimes the issue that you have is not their fault, but you can always say, thank you, I appreciate it. You know, when, people, when, we're, when, when we're out in life, so I want to just go, let's, the, the lips of the righteous nourish showing appreciation, showing thanks to our kids when they do something well or to our parents. We want to we do that. And then 
uh, Brent, the worship team, you guys can come. And then having a thankful attitude affects how you see things in the future. We talked about it negatively. So let's go back to the Harvard study with the irritation journal, okay? They also did a Thanksgiving journal, okay? Those that listed things that made them thankful rather than irritated. They started to see things this way, and it became the lens at which they began to look at life. So they started with a few things to be thankful for, but then when you start looking for things to be thankful for, then that just kind of grows in your life. Whining and complaining becomes less frequently. Thankfulness, you know, becomes how we, how we view life and appreciation to the Lord. Ed Dobson, he's the pastor emeritus of Calvary Church in Grand Rapids, Michigan. Been pastoring there for a long time. And he wrote, he wrote in his book, Seeing Through the Fog, he wrote about an episode in his life as he was pastoring. He realized that there would be times that he wanted to say something, but he couldn't get the words out of his mind, that he was going a little more blank. There would be times that he wanted to type things on the computer, but what was in his head was not getting to his fingers. He began to have memory loss. He began to lose, you know, some of his uh, motor functions as well. Some of his family began to notice this, and he went to the doctor, and they diagnosed him with ALS, okay? And he wrote, he wrote in this book about coming to the, you know, coming to the, uh, realization that this was going to be a life-changing moment. And I've got just a few paragraphs, and I'm going to put them up on the screen. He said, there were many things for which I am not grateful. I can no longer button the buttons on my shirt. I can no longer put on a heavy jacket. I can no longer raise my right hand above my head. I can no longer write. I can no longer eat with my right hand. I can eat with my left hand, but now that's becoming a challenge. And over time, all of these challenges will get worse and worse. So what in the world do I have to be grateful for. So much. The Lord for waking me up this morning. The Lord, thank the Lord. Lord, thank you that I can turn over in my bed. Lord, thank you that I can still get out of bed. Lord, thank you that I can still walk to the bathroom. Lord, thank you that I can still brush my teeth. Lord, thank you that I can still eat breakfast. Lord, thank you that I can still dress myself. Lord, thank you that I can still drive my car. Lord, thank you that I can still walk. Lord, thank you that I can still talk. And the list goes on and on. He says, I have learned in my journey with ALS to focus on what I can do, not uh, what, what I can do, not what I can't do. I have learned to be grateful for the small things in my life and for the many things that I can still do. In the midst of a devastating medical diagnosis, here's a guy that said, I'm going to find my pathway forward through thankfulness and gratefulness. And I want to say, because you can get to a certain part where whining and complaining will take you down in every way. It will bring discouragement. It will bring depression. It is not going to lift your faith to believe God. It's going to be more difficult to, play, to pray when your mindset is whining and complaining. So we want to be thankful to God. We want to be thankful to God. Psalms 100 says, Enter His gates with thanksgiving. Wow. He says, if you want to approach me, if you want to approach me, don't come with whining and complaining. But if you want to approach me, you come with a thankful and grateful heart. Even in the midst of troubles and trials, you can still be thankful. You can still be thankful. Doesn't mean that you don't pray. God, I need a miracle. God, I need a healing. God, I need you to do this. There is a difference between the groan that God heard in Egypt and the complaining that he heard in the wilderness. And God knows the difference. All right? I want you to stand. Because we're going to have a few moments of prayer and thanksgiving. All right? And I'm going to tell you where we're headed. The first part of this is we're going to repent and confess if we have leaned more toward whining and complaining than we have being thankful. Some of you, there's more negativity that comes off your lips than worship. We're going to do that. Then we're going to thank God 
for where he's brought us from. I'm going to walk you through this. We're going to thank God because we're going to be mindful. Where would I be today without the Lord? We're going to thank God for all the blessings that we have in our life, our family, home, possessions, jobs. We're going to be thankful. Then we're going to go, Lord, I want to give you thanks and praise. I'm in the middle of a storm. I'm in the middle of a time that I do not understand, but I'm going to praise. I'm going to be thankful and grateful today. All right. You ready? You ready? So let's start with maybe some confession and repentance if we've been whining and complaining. You may think it's a big, not a big deal, but the Lord does. So Lord, we just come before you today. And Lord, if we have been negative, if we have focused more on the unresolved issues, if our prayers and our worship have been more whines and complaints, then forgive us. Forgive us. Just take a moment. Is that you? Lord, cleanse my heart. Transform me by the renewing of your mind. Lord, I don't want to default to whining and complaining, murmuring and grumbling. Lord, I want to have a thankful heart, heart of gratitude. So, Lord, we thank you. We thank you. We thank you. Forgive us, Lord. Renew our minds. Forgive us, Lord, and renew our mind. All right? Ready? From across the building, I want you to give God thanks from where he brought you from. I want you to look back at your life. I want you to look back... I'm not going to lead that prayer. I just want you to do that right now. I want you to give thanks. I want you to give thanks. I want you to give thanks this morning. I want you to be mindful. Where would you be today if it wasn't for His grace? Can we take a moment and just give Him thanks this morning? Just praise and be thankful. Show gratitude for the grace of God, the hand of God. Thank you, Lord, for your saving grace. Lord, there are people here, they wouldn't even be alive this morning. There'd be people this morning, they'd be in jail. There'd be people here in the gutter. There would be addicts. There'd be marriages that would be shattered apart. Lord, thank you. We're thankful, Lord. We're thankful, Lord, that you saved us, that you redeemed us, that you washed us in the blood of Jesus. We're thankful this morning. We're a thankful people this morning. We're thankful this morning, Lord. We come to your uh, gates with thanksgiving today. Now, I want you to take a moment. I want you to give him thanks for the things in your life, your family, home, possessions, health, whatever, whatever comes to your mind. I want you to give him thanks. I'm going to be quiet. I want you just to do that work down the list. Let's give him thanks. Let's be thankful this morning. blessed us, Lord. You have blessed us. Lord, we're so short-sighted sometimes with a few unresolved things, but this morning we're giving thanks. We're giving thanks. You've blessed our hands. You've blessed our homes, our minds, and we give you thanks. We give you thanks. In the last part of this prayer this morning, there's some issues in your life. In the midst of your storm, I just want you to give God thanks. I want you to give him thanks. Financial issue, health issue, family issues, doesn't matter. In everything, give thanks in every circumstance. So across the building, I want you to give him thanks. In the midst of your fire, in the midst of the storm, in the shadow of the mountain, I want you to give him thanks. Give thanks in every circumstance. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. We worship you, Lord. We worship you, Lord. In the midst of the storm, Lord, we know that you haven't left us alone. In the midst of the storm, we know that you're going to provide. In the midst of the storm, you're going to give us grace that is sufficient to bring us through. In the midst of the storm, you're going to provide the provision that we need. Lord, in the midst of the storm, you're going to give us strength. In the midst of the storm, clear mind, clarity of heart. We thank you. We're giving thanks in every circumstance today. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Would you give the Lord a shout of praise this morning? We thank you, Lord. We thank you, Lord. 
We thank you, Lord. We thank you, Lord. We thank you, Lord.